Uh, and I all can, should I make you a host? Is that dangerous? Can that break anything? I don't know. We, I, we've done I'm it before. But then you need, we need to let people waiting room. Uh, yes, I can. I'll start just a Ironically, you now need to let me share my screen, <laughs> which is a, a wonderful uh, switch of roles. Uh, okay, there you go. You should be good. Thank you all. Let's check this works. Uh, I want to share. So we want to check brand of MetaMask works. Um, yeah, so the modal comes up. So you can see MetaMask. Okay, good. That's what we, all we want to do. Yeah. I, I have not connected it to my ledger. That's just no point. I'm just going to use a hot wallet. Um, okay. Okay, and then what happens when I go like this? Even though that's the end of the presentation. Does that look good? Yeah, it looks pretty good to me. I like the, the globe. Uh, that's Maka. Um, okay, so when do you want to, Brandon? I'm in your hands now. I'm gonna shut up. Yeah, so we've got 85 people in, um, which is great to see. Oh, and more, more on their way. Oh my word, there are so many um, members of the uh, Oxford Blockchain Society are struggling to find the link. Funnily enough. It's uh, not, got, not good rep, rep, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, yeah, I think let's, uh, let's start going. Yeah, 35 past. So I'll hand over to you, Frankie, I guess, to welcome everyone in. And because um, I'm, I'm not too good at warm welcomes. So. Yeah, amazing. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Frankie. Thank you so much for joining today. This is the first ever collaboration between Oxford Women in Business and Oxford Blockchain Society. Um, so yeah, this is gonna be a workshop and I'm told it doesn't require any technical knowledge. I personally know very little about blockchain, so I'm looking forward to learning more. Um, but yeah, I'll pass over to um, Brandon from Blockchain to tell you more. Cheers, Frankie. So yeah, I remember when we actually organized this event back in like what, October, September, and you know, like, yeah, lockdown, maybe it'll be, you know, in, in real space rather than virtual space, but here we are. Um, but I did not expect this many people to rock up. So it's great to see such a strong presence, especially from Oxford Women in Business. And it's great to organize an event like this. Um, we're lucky to have Anthony, uh, CEO of Encode Club, also a uh, Oxford uh, graduate, and um, essentially he's going to introduce uh, everyone into blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum. If you've never heard about it before, this is a great presentation to come to. Um, and I'm sure Anthony may give us a bit of a taster of the uh, upcoming excitements in the blockchain space, such as a uh, DeFi. Um, if you haven't heard of Enco Club, definitely check them out. They organize amazing hackathons, uh, one of which is about to end soon. Um, famously last year, the last hackathon I think was won by an Oxford graduate as well, um, and went on to raise quite a bit of money as a startup. But uh, I'll leave the rest for Anthony. I don't want to steal his thunder. So all yours, Anthony. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brandon, and nice to, to see you all this evening. Uh, thank you for coming along. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, tell you as much as possible in the simplest possible terms about what blockchain is, uh, why you should be excited, uh, and how to get involved, and yeah, everything in between. So let me start by sharing my screen, uh, and let's, let's get that going. Uh, if you have any questions uh, during the talk, guys, uh, please do not hesitate to ask questions. Um, I will try and keep a watch over the chat. Uh, and uh, yeah, anything that you want to ask, please feel free to kind of do so. Um, Brandon, can, is my screen nice and visible? Can you see the presentation? Yeah, the presentation's looking great. Actually, on that note about the chat, please like pop in where you're from. Let's get this to be a nice homely atmosphere. You know, what subject you're doing what time zone you're in. I'm sure there are people from all over the world uh, on this call. But yeah, sorry, go ahead, Anthony. Awesome. Right, so introduction to blockchain. 
Uh, so a little bit of background uh, about Encode Club, uh, which is the company I run. Uh, we are a community of kind of university hackers, developers, and in general, our aim is to educate people about blockchain, support them and back them uh, in the space, be it investing in them, be it finding them jobs, everything kind of in between. Um, we work uh, in kind of many different areas. Uh, Brandon mentioned the hackathons. We run big kind of hackathons, let people code and build stuff with blockchain. We run accelerators for the best projects. We have, have a recruitment arm, we invest, we educate, and we do AMAs with the leading thought leaders in the space. Um, we work across 75 different universities with student clubs like Oxford Blockchain uh, and, and everything in between. Uh, and in general, uh, yeah, it's a nice fervent community that, that, is, that is a nice place to learn and experience blockchain. Uh, first, I wanna kind of put a bit of a hook here uh, because some of you will have heard about blockchain and crypto. Uh, and I wanna give you all the opportunity to kind of actually get some money out of this event because why not money is a good thing some crypto money which is real money you can use it you can't perhaps use it to buy a coffee but you could definitely sell it into something that could buy a coffee uh, so everyone we're going to give out i think brandon we said over 100 pounds worth of crypto in, in 10 kind of little bites um i'm going to actually demonstrate how we send that uh and brandon's also going to send some money around but uh, the first thing to say is if anyone wants some free money we do you have to do a little bit of work uh, this is not work in promotional in promotional terms but actually just to set up a wallet so that you can receive crypto. Uh, so uh, Brandon, what I want you to do, can you paste a link to MetaMask? For anyone that is interested in some free money and wants to do some, some homework during this event, please go to MetaMask. It's a Google browser. Uh, you can download it simply like this. Uh, you go, you, you install it. Uh, you, uh, it will ask you to set up a quick account. Uh, you will, it will ask you for a little password. It will ask you to save a kind of seed phrase in case you lose access to it. And then uh, eventually, once it's set up, uh, you will have a wallet that looks like it's all very kind of simple and easy to do. Uh, a wallet that, if this loads properly, uh, looks like this. And this is a crypto wallet. And we'll talk about what a crypto wallet is in a minute. But if anyone wants kind of £10 worth of crypto, uh, please uh, set up MetaMask. And I'll tell you what to do if you have done that a bit later on. Uh, but now let's find out what is what am I actually talking about when I saw wallets and crypto and money and etc. So you will have heard of Bitcoin. Many of you have heard of Bitcoin right now as this kind of crypto blockchain-y, maybe even kind of semi kind of scammy illegal thing called Bitcoin. By the way, Bitcoin doesn't exist. It's not a it's not a Bitcoin does exist, but there is no physical representation of Bitcoin. It's purely digital. Uh, these are illustrative kind of art pieces of art. Uh, where people put the, the logo of Bitcoin on coins. There's no such thing as a Bitcoin that you physically hold. It's purely digital. Now, the reason you might particularly have heard of Bitcoin right now is because the Bitcoin price, the price of a Bitcoin, a whole Bitcoin, has rocketed to record highs. In fact, crypto is, in, is the most valuable it has ever been. And Bitcoin went to 42,000. For comparison's sake, the previous all-time high, which it passed just around Christmas, uh, was 20,000. So it's, it's already doubled its, its all-time high. And also for comparison, that during kind of depths of COVID, kind of Aprily, uh, Bitcoin, I think, went down to kind of 4,000, maybe even 3,000, uh, something kind of ludicrous. It's been a, a volatile and, and kind of crazy ride over the last uh, few months or so. But this is where you might have heard increasingly more about this thing called Bitcoin. And I want to, first of all, this is a very dense slide, so I'm going to just explain it. But I want to kind of deambiguate some things just so we can get it to get the kind of jargon out of the way. So Bitcoin is just a cryptocurrency. And a cryptocurrency you can think of like a currency that uses this very technical thing called cryptography. But you should think of Bitcoin like a currency, like a pound, like a dollar, like the euro, whatever. To make this whole thing work, you need this technology called blockchain. And block all blockchain is, is a way for lots of people to agree that something has happened without needing someone in the middle, like a bank or a government, to say that it is the case. And we use this thing called cryptography, which is basically, in the most simplest terms, a way of uh, making sure that we can transport information and communication uh, as privately and as safely as possible. Uh, and we use lots of codes to do this. This is a very kind of simplified version. But I want you to think of Bitcoin as a currency. So. And then I want, to think, I want you to think about blockchain as a spreadsheet. Uh, so you, all of you have used a spreadsheet. You know what a spreadsheet looks like. A blockchain is effectively a very complicated way of doing a spreadsheet that everyone has access to. Imagine a spreadsheet the whole world had editorship rights to. And money itself is also kind of like a spreadsheet. So with money, if I want to send money to Brandon, and then we're going to, let's get this, we'll go into that in a minute. But if I want to send money to Brandon, What's stopping me? And I've got 10 pounds in my pocket. 
let's say I do it digitally. What's stopping me spending this twice, giving it to Brandon, also giving it to Francesca? Where is this kind of thing that says Anthony has £10 less when he sends it to Brandon and Brandon has 10 times £10 more? Clearly with cash, this is easy. But when I'm sending digital money, if I'm sending a bank transfer, how is it the case that it is that someone knows that I have £10 less and Brandon has £10 more? And the answer is that banks kind of work by effectively having a big spreadsheet which says, I have X, you have Y. If I send you money, then take a little bit off my X and give a little bit more to their Y. So banks, the fundamental kind of framework of how a money system works is it's effectively a, a spreadsheet underneath. And when you think of it in this terms, a spreadsheet of who has what and who's given what to who, then you can actually think, well, can't we rebuild this? Uh, why, what is the role of a bank here? And the role of a bank here, quite simply, is to confirm that this spreadsheet is right and that it <laughs> represents the things that happened before. And that, that uh, you can imagine a situation in general, if you didn't have banks and you might be trying to run a currency, of how the hell do we keep this spreadsheet safe that says who has what, this kind of big list, this big ledger. So that's why banks exist in the real world. What I'm going to say to you today is you can build this whole system, not this whole system, but you can certainly build a currency without needing a central bank in the middle. And just to kind of go over what we just, I just kind of spelled out, um, think of it like, this is a very, very quick video. I hope that displays nicely. Um, this is a ledger. This is, a, let's say, these are numbers and bits of money that people have. Um, imagine what I'm describing here is imagine a case where I'm trying to, Bob is trying to, uh, Carol is trying to pay Bob. What we would do in this instance, what banks do is they effectively say, okay, Bob now has five pounds more. Carol now has five pounds less. Now, let's go into a little bit deeper. So if this goes um, and go back to kind of this idea of Bitcoin as a currency. So I've told you that this is how money works. Um, what I want to do now is kind of talk about how, um, uh, how you might replace this. Now, what blockchain effectively says, blockchain is a spreadsheet. So what we can now say is that we would like our, uh, we, rather than having a bank hold this spreadsheet, we want everyone to hold this spreadsheet. Now you might be thinking, okay, I get this, but this is unfeasible for everyone to hold a copy of a list of all the transactions. Well, blockchain effectively is a very simple, pithy, well, quite complicated, but quite easy, simple way in order to maintain the spreadsheet and give everyone a copy of this spreadsheet such that when I send money to Brandon, everyone gets updated with this piece of information. Everyone has the same information at only one piece of time. And once you have this, you get to a situation where I do not necessarily need a bank in the middle to control this spreadsheet. I can have a system where, uh, where, uh, where uh, I do not need a central party. Things can be completely decentralized. And this is what we're trying to achieve here. So we're now gonna go into a little bit more of the depths of this because this was quite uh, kind of complicated. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to create a system that has these four features. Now the, my, the chat is kind of hiding these four features. Uh, so let me make sure I can see them. So one thing with, a, with money, with a spreadsheet, we want it to be unchangeable. We don't want someone to go back and to change who has what money at any few, a bit of time. This is why banks are very good. We can pretty much trust banks, well, most of the, most of the time, to make sure that the state of affairs of who has what money uh, is, uh, is, is known and isn't for to change with. This is what we mean by immutable. We can't change it. So a currency, a spreadsheet, you shouldn't be able to change it if you're going to use it for money. We also want to achieve this new thing, which is decentralization. And there's a reason why we, do, why we want to achieve decentralization, because with back, it's great that and money works in the real world completely fine and in a kind of functioning manner. But unfortunately, it is the case, rightly or wrongly, that some people are kind of barred from having bank accounts or some people um, you can't send money between certain parties. Again, there are good reasons for this. I'm simply kind of uh, pitching the kind of the theoretical base of this, not the what it looks like in practice. But it might be the case that we want we want we don't want banks to be in charge of, of who gets to who is allowed to have money and who's allowed to trade money. In this case, we want it kind of to be trustless. We, if the banks break down, as we saw in 2008, the banking system breaks down, everyone suffers. And this is kind of bad. There is a central point of failure. So what if we could build a currency? Could we build a monetary system where you don't actually have to trust one single party? That if one single party does something bad, that it doesn't bring down the whole system. And the last thing is, okay. To do this, you clearly need the agreement of, every, of everyone to kind of say, this is a good idea. Uh, and we want this whole system to be incentivized in some way so that people actually want to take part in the system. So this is the kind of hallmarks of blockchain. Now, 
I've used one very specific example, which is money. We can apply this, where is that? Yeah, money. Uh, we can apply this actually university and blockchain, but we're gonna use the example of money today to kind of, uh, kind of make this all very clear. So now I wanna to talk to you about blockchain as a computer. So I've kind of said to you already that uh, Bitcoin is a currency. Currencies or money typically function like spreadsheets and banks maintain the spreadsheet. And what I'm saying with blockchain is why don't we all, why don't we run this spreadsheet not controlled by one person? Why don't we all have a copy of this spreadsheet and basically have the ability to change it and have a way of settling that uh, what is happening at any one time. That I have given money to Brandon, I know that we'll have this money and Brandon does have this money. So it's, we need to start thinking of, okay, how does this actually work? This is great claims, Anthony, but this sounds very complicated. So this is a nice funky diagram. On the left, we have nodes. We can think of these as people, you and me, uh, computers in, in many respects, but you and me. On the middle, we have a consensus mechanism. And when I talk about consensus mechanism, I mean just agreeing that what's happened, what, agreeing the state of affairs, agreeing that I have this much money, Brandon has this much money, and doing this to a much bigger set. And on the right, we kind of have this idea of memory and processing. So memory is just remembering that all the tra what transactions have happened. What, what, who transferred money to, to whom uh, in kind of various stages of, of history. And processor is kind of, well, actually you can imagine there's a lot of transactions to get through here. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that computing power that might be needed to kind of, uh, kind of uh, power the system. And so we kind of need some, we need a processor, a virtual machine, something to kind of, um, kind of churn through this and make sure everything is kind of running perfectly fine. Um, so a blockchain kind of looks like this and the most important thing here is the consensus mechanism. And what the consensus mechanism does is basically have rounds of voting to say, where people say, ah, okay, Brandon did receive this money, Anthony did send it. And maybe someone else goes, actually, this wasn't the case. And it's a question of who agrees that this happened. And that we use, again, now we're gonna get into complicated technological stuff, which isn't for this, this kind of talk, but we use something called mining effectively and various kind of variations of mining to kind of use computing power to verify is Anthony right when he says that he sent the money or is Brandon right when he said he didn't receive the money. And there are various kind of very complicated ways to do this everywhere in between. What I want you to kind of understand is that we've actually now, rather than having a bank sitting in the middle going, ah, no, 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 Anthony has that. Anthony doesn't have that money anymore and Brandon does have it. We're using this complex case thing called a consensus mechanism to say, no, 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 no. We can do this as code. We can cryptographically, we can use computing power to figure out what happened. We don't have to have someone in the middle as a central party who might be a point of failure to tell us that. Um, so what is the result of all this? Uh, the result is a system that guarantees that to anyone using it through code, you can see it in line of code it, on your computer, uh, that something has happened and you do not need someone in the middle uh, to tell you it as that has actually been the case who might be a point of failure. And now going back to our money example, this is extremely powerful because now you have a currency that runs, quite frankly, on my computer and on anyone's computer, and that can run in a complete censorship resistant way that no one can stop it running um, without needing someone in the middle. And if any one party or lots of parties were to kind of uh, uh, withdraw from the system, it would see it still function absolutely perfectly because all we are effectively doing is maintaining a copy of a big spreadsheet between lots and lots of different people. So- And um, our- Oh, hello. Okay, that was, I don't know what that was. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm not going to go into the techie definition of blockchain because uh, I don't think that's uh, needed right now. Uh, but I want to use this kind of, again, this is a bit more technical, um, but we're going to talk about various levels uh, here. So what I want to talk about next is smart contracts. Because what are smart contracts? Um, so uh, this is all well and good, this idea of this spreadsheet. And I guess, Anthony, it kind of sounds, sounds cool that I guess I could have a spreadsheet and I could send money between people that's effectively code but this sounds like very niche and like i don't get it how does this become something that's worth forty two thousand? well you've got to add the idea of smart contracts because what we are effectively doing is we're not actually sending money <laughs> when i send brandon a bitcoin or part of a bitcoin i'm actually sending him data i mean sending him lines of code <laughs> effectively and uh if, you, if you're merely sending lines of code to people, sending little bits of data, well, maybe we could start doing other computery things on top of those uh, that uh, that's looks a little bit kind of like if then statements uh, in spreadsheets, if those of you, for those of you are familiar. So what we can start doing is this. If we, we could start saying rather than having 
kind of uh, systems in the world where um, you might have middlemen who do contracts, who lawyers who facilitate agreements, insurers who pay out if certain events happen in the world, brokers that uh, take your money uh, when you're paying for a house and give you the house in return, subject to the money getting received and subject to agreement being satisfied. You can break down all these transactions in the world pretty much to kind of if then statements. Uh, if X does Y, then give this money uh, to Z or give X's money to Z, or uh, let's take the kind of uh, insurance thing. If natural world disaster might happen, um, give X a, a payout from party Y. Um, and there are obviously more complexities around this, but you can start looking at it in terms of kind of simple if then statements. And the smart contract just says this, it says, okay, we've got money that now exists like code that now exists on my computer purely. Uh, it's not, it doesn't exist in a bank, it doesn't exist uh, kind of uh, <laughs> anywhere apart from, it's kind of just, it's, it's, it's bytes, it's data, it's code. Um, why can't I start building applications on top of that, um, that based on kind of simple if then statements? This is what smart contracts are. Uh, and the main smart contract platform is something called Ethereum. And all Ethereum does, it says, you can do execute this thing if these conditions are satisfied. And the currency used within Ethereum is something called Ether. Uh, it's another currency and it acts just like a currency, except it's used to kind of pay for, to power these smart contracts. Um, so hold this thought as well, because we're actually going to be gonna giving, we're going to be giving out some Ethereum uh, very shortly. So we've talked about money. We've said, we've got this thing called Bitcoin, which I want you to think of like a currency, which effectively the way it works, oh, where has it gone? which effectively the way it works is like a spreadsheet, which says I have X, he has Y amount of the currency. Uh, and we can actually, we could run this completely digitally if we so wanted to. There's many reasons not to, but hypothetically. Uh, and I've said that there's this thing called consensus mechanisms that replace the role of the bank in confirming that everything has happened. And now I wanna go into smart contracts, which have said, okay, well, if I'm sending money digitally anyway, can't I build if then statements on top of it to do other cool things? So this all sounds very esoteric, like what is the relevance of this? So let's go into a few areas of disruption. So let's, first of all, I want to start with finance because actually that's the most relevant one. And we're going to look at some actually examples of some real things you can use right now, which is called decentralized finance, where I can do financially things, financial type things uh, without, uh, yeah, on crypto right now with blockchain. Uh, so um, in finance, uh, you can understand that uh, the most basic type of finance is fundraising uh, and saying that, so investing in X project because I think it's good and because I think it will make me a profit. And the most big, the biggest kind of example of this in crypto is something called the ICO boom. Some of you might've heard of ICOs. All it was, was effectively funding a lot of early stage startups, a bit like Kickstarter. And what it would say is this, it would say, I have a cool product. I have a cool project. I've written a, a research paper for it. It was actually as basic as that. Um, I would like to raise money for this idea. So what I'm going to say is this. Um, every time uh, for I'm going to set a funding target of like 5 million. And if I hit this target, uh, people can you send money to this kind of account. And if, it, if enough money gets to this account, if I get to this 5 million, I will give everyone a share relative to how much they invested of another token. And this token will could be or just let's just think of it just as a share of something that happened to be represented represented as a token, uh, as like a like a yeah like a coupon, like anything you would kind of associate as a token. Um, and this is the most basic smart contract. It's an if then statement. If enough, if enough, if my fundraising target is hit, give everyone a share of something. Uh, and this actually led to a boom, but we'll go into that a bit later. But immediately there is a very simple use case in crypto of fundraising uh, that based on the most simple if then statement. But what you can start doing after this is you can do cooler things. Because if I've already established that I can now have a digital currency where I can send money to Brandon and we can agree that I've sent him this money, whatever this money might be worth, by the way, which happens to be worth a lot, uh, and I can do fundraising, I can start doing other things. I can start doing lending. I could lend Brandon my tokens temporarily. I could start um, doing complex trades. I, I could start... Uh, 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 doing, um, I don't know, any kind of any uh, kind of project uh, product that banks kind of do right now. I could start doing insurance. Anything that you could, any kind of financial product effectively is in its basis is some simple code. If this happens, do this. And I can start rebuilding it. So an obvious area for disruption with blockchain is finance. And again, we're going to go into, this is all very general. We're going to go into some very specific things that exist right now. And I'm going to show you them shortly. Another one is obviously data. 
um, is that um, the good thing about blockchain is it's effectively storing a lot of data. Like in, in a currency terms, I'm storing the data of who has what currency. Um, but we can do also, we can do cool things such as uh, I can store medical data. And you might be thinking, how does that happen? Well, to interact with blockchain, for those of you that are setting up a MetaMask right now, I effectively need some sort of passcode to access my account. My account is, is like just a, an address. It's just like a normal account. But I effectively need a passcode. And I use, this passcode is a bit more fancy than a normal password. It's kind of cryptographic password, which means I, I have this thing called a private key, which in basic terms is a really long password that you wouldn't be able to just remember. And you have to actually store this password uh, somewhere um, that's uh, uh, kind of a little bit more sophisticated, either in a very long way written down or on literally this device I have here. Um, like it's uh, uh, just a, a USB stick, but it holds a, like a very long password. Um, there are other ways to, do, to store this, um, but in general, uh, yeah. So if you agree that we now got this thing that is, uh, <laughs> I need a very complicated password and a system to access, well, maybe I could start storing my data with this, like money is data. Why could I not store my healthcare data? And the whole point of this key is that only I can access this and only I can give permission to share it. So what if I started from the premise that I own my medical data? Because currently, you, all of you have your medical data, it's saved at the NHS or whatever kind of, uh, kind of uh, jurisdiction you're based and they have your medical data. Do you actually access it right now? Do you actually have it? Like, how would you get hold of it? How would you make sure that if so, you didn't want someone to have your medical data, so you could revoke the right to it? Currently, you can't do any of that. But what you could do maybe in the future is that you could have your data on something like this or on an account, which only you have access to. And you could temporarily give people access to it if you wanted to, such as the NHS. And you could revoke this access and you could take it with you. All of these things could be possible with blockchain because again, we are just moving data around. Data could also be represented in a spread in spreadsheet form. Many people do that every day. Um, there are reasons why this kind of picture of the world will probably not be true. There are practical reasons, but this is one such area that you can't start to think about how you could use blockchain. The other one is kind of identity. And it's this same thing, that if I have this thing that's effectively a complicated password um, that I store on a device that uh, <laughs> I, I, I need to have a complicated way of accessing like a, a nice uh, kind of maybe it's it's linked to my fingerprint in some way. Um, I could start maybe having a digital identity of the world, such as what I find it really stupid right now that for your Facebook account, for your Google account, for your Twitter account, um, it's the only way. Like it's quite easy to get into a password. Like maybe you they most people don't set the so set different passwords for each. Uh, most people just leave themselves logged in all the time. Um, we see these hacking incidents happening all the time. Um, and I, these strikes me that there's two problems here. One is that we have different accounts for everything, uh, which means that these things about everyone having the same password for everything happen. Uh, and two, uh, data gets compromised all the time. So I think it's most likely in the future, we're gonna end up having one digital identity that's protected in a really safe way. That's something I can revoke access to any one period of time. And you could start doing something like this with crypto. You could say, okay, well, I, and we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how this might work uh, shortly because you can already do this. Uh, I can only access this account if uh, I use my kind of proper thing that stores this very long password. And every time I go into it, I have to click a button that says, yes, this is me. Uh, I, I'm on this device. I have this physical device with me. Uh, and uh, if my data were to be compromised, if I, if I ever thought my data might be compromised, I can revoke access to this all on, on one device. Again, it seems really stupid to me in the, in the world these days that we have a million accounts for everything. And I can 100% see a world where you want to very safely have one account that only, I've, only I have access to, and it's kind of air gapped. And you could start doing that with a, some sort of blockchain based system. Uh, and the last thing is kind of ownership. So um, what I mean here is not um, ownership as in physically tangibly having things, but crypto allows you to start to do kind of more innovative ownership models. Um, and so this is a thing called tokenization. So basically tokenization says this, uh, remember the if then statements from previously when we talked about fundraising, we said, okay, if a certain fundraising target is hit, give everyone a share relative to how much they invested. Well, you could also say, give everyone a share represented by this other token, um, this thing, let's call it Brandon has a great idea. Maybe it's for a new, uh, I don't know, uh, a new, uh, I don't know what it might be. What, Brandon, what, what idea? He does quantum, so it's a new, it's a new quantum startup. He wants to, we, everyone thinks it's gonna be the, the best thing since sliced bread. So he wants to raise 10 million for it. And then he says, okay, guys, I'm gonna, doing, I, I wanna, I'm gonna offer this uh, people to, I'm gonna let people raise money, send some Ethereum, send some money to this address. And relative to how much you sent to this address, I will give you a share. And actually what I'm gonna do, what is this share represented as? I'm gonna call it Brandon coin. 
uh, and you could do this very simply in blockchain and I will give you brand and coin, this much brand and coin relative to how much you invested. And suddenly now you have a representation of equity. This is like equity. He sold uh, based on what, he, uh, what we think brand and coin might be, uh, which you can write down. Uh, we have given some brand and coin to everyone. Um, and what this starts to allow you to do is you can start doing, you can use this basic principle of, uh, for fundraising to maybe break down other assets into smaller things. So maybe you could say, okay, um, who wants to buy a, a tiny share of my house? Uh, so I'm going to tokenize my house. So uh, I'm going to say my house is now represented by a million pieces in code. Uh, I'm going to say, yeah, my house equals now a million pieces. I will sell a million pieces uh, at a, a value of uh, one millionth of the, the house's actual value. And this allows people to kind of invest in my house without having to buy the whole of my house, which kind of seems stupid that I want to maybe own some, own some real estate in New York, but I don't want to buy a whole house. Why can't I do this right now? Uh, this should be a simple problem to solve. You could do that. I think we've lost a uh, connection to Anthony for the brief time, but we have some questions in the chat, which I'll happily uh, discuss. So Juliet asks, uh, hi, I have a question. If we use MetaMask for more and more things that structure a society, finance, data, money, doesn't that give the same power to people who own MetaMask? Um, yes and no. So in the traditional sense, yes. Uh, if MetaMask essentially had control over this super long password. But in fact, MetaMask actually doesn't. So what MetaMask is, is just a mechanism for you to interface with um, whatever blockchain you're dealing with, whether it's a finance one, a data one, or a money one. Um, furthermore, there are many other uh, options other than MetaMask, which are free and open source. So um, even if they were, there are, there are also other, other options. I hope that's clear, because um, that's quite an important thing to understand essentially whoever has the private key is in control of the the data and the interface with the blockchain or what what the permissions that can occur on the blockchain um how scalable are smart contracts like ethereum asks samuel so say it's being used globally um yeah, so that's quite interesting because I'd say it depends what you mean by scalability. At the moment, they are actually are very scalable uh, and they are being used globally. So I think this is something that Anthony's going to touch on later in his presentation when he uh, gets back. But there are amazing things going on, such as um, I'll mention this is the interplanetary file system. Uh, which is essentially an Ethereum smart contract uh, type of idea where rather than storing, let's say, your web pages on just Amazon's web servers, you can store them on multiple different computers. Um, and so when you go to a particular domain, let's say you go to google.com or the equivalent on the interplanetary file system network, it's actually pulling data from multiple different computers rather than just one server such as the Google servers um, when you access that website. Furthermore, so Aris, this is a great question. What happens if I lose my private key? Uh, and this is, I think, actually the, the, the crux of crypto, which is, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty much game over then. So if you lose your private key, you lose uh, the ability to sign um, and maintain your essentially your identity, which is why it's very important that we do safety mechanisms such as backups. So you can back up your private key. Um, but this is what happens when we move from a custodian solution or custodial world where we trust our data and our money with custodians such as banks or the NHS. Uh, and we take full control. And some people actually don't want to do that. But it looks like Anthony's back. So uh, my laptop just completely died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, sorry, everyone. Let me let me go yeah. back. 
Um, uh, yeah, I was just covering some questions in the chat. Um, I've only got a few more slides to go and then we'll, we'll take questions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry about that, everyone. That was um, my laptop just deciding to give up on life. Okay. Um, let's see what's happening here. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Let me, the presentation is not really loading. Let me. Hmm. What is happening here? Uh, bear with. Outstanding technical difficulties today. Why is this not working? Now it's decided to reload. Come on, computer. I want this present button to suddenly go yellow. Come on. Uh, but yeah, in, in summary to actually both Juliet and Aris, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, let me know if I'm not. Um, is, yeah, there's this like key phrase that you should definitely walk away with, which is not your keys, uh, not your coins. So if you don't have your private key or access to it, you're not going to have your Bitcoin or your Ethereum. Um, oh. And furthermore, if someone else has control over your keys, especially your private key, um, then yeah, you're in you're in big big lumber uh, to use the uh, the British phrase. There we go. Yep. We're so still, yes, it's loading for me at the moment. Yeah, let's give it a little go. Oh, here we go. Okay, good. Okay, you're okay. back. Okay, I'll hand over to you again. Okay, we're almost there. So we ended on ownership, which is, uh, Brandon has very neatly said, uh, uh, we talk about kind of keys, but uh, yeah, I think we ended on saying about how you might be able to tokenize things that you traditionally can't tokenize and build new kind of innovative kind of models. Uh, I'll give you kind of a very anecdotal thing. There is a guy now who's tokenized himself. He's called Alex. Uh, and Alex tokenized himself and offers access to kind of uh, content like uh, YouTube content, uh, kind of blog content, and also kind of special kind of features and special kind of uh, kind of uh, rights to a cool business he's creating. Uh, and obviously he doesn't, uh, and also his income as well. And he does this because it's a way he wants to raise money to kind of do his ideas and pursue his passions. And this was a cool way to do it, a bit gimmicky, um, but yeah, you might start seeing kind of ownership models where people literally start tokenizing themselves and giving people a code representation of themselves and something in the real world uh, to do cool things. We can discuss that in questions uh, if anyone's interested. Um, in general, this is quite a nice, neat overview if you want to look at blockchain as a computer, um, uh, PCs uh, were great because they were small and cheap. Smartphones were great because they added things like portability. They had GPS cameras. Um, blockchain is great because it provides trust. Brandon gave that fantastic quote of not your keys, uh, not your coins. And in general, I could apply this to many things. Uh, if you don't have access to your data on Facebook and don't actually have any way of checking Facebook, don't have your data or aren't using your data badly, like you really have a lack of control over it. Uh, and in the same thing, to a lesser extent with money, because we can actually tangibly hold our money, um, the blockchain starts to allow you to be kind of have trust guarantees that stuff that are happening, because you can literally see it. And I'll show you transactions on a blockchain uh, shortly uh, and how you kind of can get access to that. Um, killer applications. Uh, so PCs, the killer thing was kind of spreadsheets, doing stuff on the desktop. Smartphones, it was applications, weirdly like ride hailing, photo sharing. Blockchain, we're going to see this kind of digital primitives, which in the basic terms mean cool stuff with digital money. If you have money built into your phone, built into your browser, what cool things can you start doing? Um, and uh, yeah, these are kind of, this is a general overview as well of how uh, Bitcoin uh, is uh, is kind of like an application. It's like a currency, it's a virtual application, the technology in the same way that, I don't know, a, a Fitbit is something you use or a, uh, I don't know, uh, an application or iPhone is, is something you use. Uh, it's an application. Ethereum is more of a platform which you can do stuff on. It's a bit more like an app store. It's a bit more like uh, a kind of uh, an iPhone itself. You would build stuff on this. Uh, so just kind of some some, some bits of a uh, uh, kind of definitional stuff. Um, 
this is a good barometer for how popular crypto has been. It's not a perfect barometer, um, but this is the market cap of uh, Ethereum. Uh, and uh, so this is worth roughly a trillion now. It's had a bull run. Um, but you can see that for many years, not many years, a couple of years, it was kind of nothing happened. And then people started doing those, that fundraising thing I mentioned. Will you give me this number of shares if, uh, if, if I raise a certain amount? And then it kind of like people raise a lot of money. Like this is a lot of money. It's like over, over half a billion. And then uh, people realize, ah, okay, this is actually not very useful for anything bar a gimmick or bar kind of fundraising. I could do cool things. Uh, and then this thing called DeFi, which we're going to talk about in a minute and actually use, uh, which is financial stuff built with blockchain started. And now we've got this COVID boom and well, you can think what you like. This is like a nice like trend of, of what's happened, which you can also see this kind of trough to this peak is, is quite a huge amount. And this was March <laughs> and this is now, uh, and it's kind of uh, very much uh, kind of eight gone up eight times in value, which is definitely overvalued, but well, maybe not overvalued, but seems overvalued in the short term, given what happened in that time period. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I want to now try some cool things because uh, we we've, we've spoken in very general terms about blockchain as a spreadsheet and how you can send data and send money. But we're actually gonna we're gonna do it right now. Uh, so uh, what I want is a volunteer uh, who would like uh, ten pounds right now uh, in crypto. Uh, so I want so if someone is up for it. So Adam Adam G says me great. So what you have to do, sir, is have you downloaded MetaMask? Have you got a little fox in your browser? Uh, say yes, if that is the case. By the way, can you see my browser? I assume you can see this little fox. Good, let's make sure I close this. Yes, I've got MetaMask. Okay, cool, Adam. So I want you to open up this little fox. Feels a bit like a magic trick. Uh, it's not magic, I'm sure you. So let me put my password in. I've got MetaMask on my phone. Is that gonna work out? Absolutely perfectly. So what you do need to do, however, is you need to send me this address, which is your crypto address. Uh, so the way you do it, either you can, if you're on browser, you can literally go copy and you can paste it in chat. This is a public address, everyone. everyone you can see, for instance, if I can show you my public address. Uh, that's a good thing. It's still all this, there's ways to do it privately, but in general, this is public. Uh, so you can see every time I've sent money, this is my, me, this long bit of code, sending someone else 0.05 ether. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if you can paste that long number, um, if you're on phone, it might be diff more difficult, but there are also ways That's to do it. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Uh, you uh, can go to account details and you can copy and paste it that way. Uh, or if someone has a laptop, we're going to give 10, 10 lots of this out. So if someone has uh, a, a MetaMask, they're ready to go, then I'll send it to that. Great, here we go. Nice. Uh, Samuel, I'll talk about that in a minute quite safe because oh, I actually, it's, not, it's not my main address address is a flying into the chat so i'm going to send people money so i have some money here this is 0 0.2 ether uh, this is uh just a, a wallet i use I actually you, you can have many wallets uh, all of which i kind of have the private keys for on here um but uh, in general i'm going to send some ETH. so what i do i go send i copy and paste the address you might be thinking how do you get this right i check the first three and i check the last three so i'm going to check 0x6 and AF8. Let me go back to chat and make sure I'm not being an idiot. Yep, I'm good. And I'm going to send, let's send 0 0.01 ETH, which is about $13, 10 quid. And I want to do this fast. So there is a transaction fee here. This is to kind of pay for the computing power needed to verify that I'm about to send this chap some money. Uh, so now I'm going to go next. If I was doing this more securely, I would actually sign this with this. I'm doing this in what's called a hot wallet. So technically, if you did hack my computer now, you could steal this money. If like if you managed to get onto my laptop right now, you could take this 300 pounds. I don't care because it's 300 pounds. Uh, so I confirm. And you might be thinking, what's happening now? So let's have a look. So let's now go to, uh, let's go to Etherscan. Uh, where is Etherscan? So we're going to go to Etherscan. This is a record of all transactions and it's pending. And what, what's happening here is people are confirming that this has happened. So they say it's going to take about 45 seconds. Uh, this is now, it's going to a lot of people who are in the world who are going, okay, I've seen that this has happened. I agree. Send everyone a message sending this has happened. And the next person goes, I've seen this happen. Send everyone a message. And eventually if enough of these do it, uh, we should get this confirmed. 
okay, 35 seconds. This is, you can see that uh, the, the network is a little bit slow today. 42 seconds. We're gonna talk about this as a problem in a second. 46 seconds, 50 seconds. It's gonna get jammed for gas, isn't it now, Brandon? <laughs> Yeah, most likely, but and it, it's gone. So hey, oh, it went minutes. through. There you go. So at one minute, it's success. It's gone to this address. There should be a brand new address, or he's it's a brand new address. Which this is, and he's got some money. So, and now we can confirm this has happened because I should have a little bit less money. So I just now sent some money. That took a minute. Uh, there are faster ways to do it. There are slow ways to do it. Depends how much fees you pay. But in general, I just sent money. The good thing is, he happens. I hope well. He might be sitting in Oxford, he might be sitting anywhere else. Um, but I could have sent that to anyone in the world in that time. That's cool. Like think how long it would take to send money to Australia right now. It usually takes a couple of days. I can do it in a minute, less than a minute. Like this was slow <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Like that's quite cool. So we're gonna give more people money. So Brandon, uh, please note down nine addresses and um, we're gonna send out 0 0.01 ether, uh, which is roughly at today's prices worth about $13 uh, to 10 people. Uh, so we're well, 10 in total, so nine more. Uh, and you can kind of play with this, this money in general. Um, I want to do some other cool things because you might be thinking sending money sounds cool. This is great. I see that it's on this kind of public thing where I can see who sent money, but eh, you've sent money. What else can I do? Well, I might want to uh, start trading coins uh, and move into a different currency. So let's go into another one. So this is called Uniswap. And this is really cool. So this is, a, this is like a... Uh, you've all kind of seen stocks and shares. You've all seen the London Stock Exchange where you can technically buy and sell. Um, but I want to buy and I want to do this, uh, but I don't want to deal with uh, kind of uh, banks. I want to deal with kind of people like myself, Brandon. And what Uniswap says is this, anyone can create a market. Uh, anyone can put their coins up to kind of, uh, to, to kind of get some interest. Uh, and in return, we, we can, if we pull all this together, if everyone goes, okay, I'm happy to put my tokens on the line, uh, and get a bit of interest uh, and kind of benefit in the system. And a lot of people go, I want to buy some stuff. We can eventually pull this together into a quasi stock market, a quasi market. There's a complicated way why we do this. It's called liquidity pools, which I'm more than happy to go into. But effectively what this is at Uniswap is a way where I am trading uh, with people like Brandon uh, right now uh, without needing to, uh, without need to go through a central party. Uh, so what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to swap ETH for another token. And this token I'm going to swap into is called DAI. Now DAI is cool because DAI is a stable coin. And what stable coins say is this. Um, Ethereum, you saw before, is a bit stupid because it's, uh, it is a bit volatile. So if I was going to pay someone's salary um, <laughs> and I agreed a contract nine months ago and I agreed it in Ether and Ether did, let's look at the markets. Uh, let's, uh, that's not going to be the right one. Uh, where is the chart? We want the chart. Please don't break my computer. There we go. So we saw this earlier. Um, if I agreed a contract at the, at the start there <laughs> and then tried to pay it now, this would be a very expensive contract. So clearly I don't want to pay for stuff in Ethereum. I want to pay for something that's linked to the dollar that's worth $1. This is called DAI. Uh, and it's a much better way of actually sending money, uh, but not as fun because it can't go up as much. It's pretty much fixed to a dollar. Uh, so I'm now going to do the same. I want to get some DAI. In fact, I actually already have some DAI. So let's go for a, a similar one that's called USDC because I don't have any USDC right now. So I'm going to swap this much and I want to get 13 uh, USDC. So I'm going to click swap. It's going to say, this is going to, don't worry about that. It's going to be a small fee. I'm going to, this in my browser, my account, my whole like bank account, think how difficult it is to use HSBC or like Santander and how like arduous it is. This is in my bank account. So I pay for something like this, a bit like a debit card, I guess. Uh, but, uh, and now you see the problems. So in crypto, uh, it happened to be the case that I spent £3.50 uh, to send that money before. Now it's actually going to cost me £21, which you can see is a quite a major problem. So transactions of this size are kind of stupid, but we're going to do it anyway for argument's sake. My transaction's been submitted. It's pending. I can view it on Etherscan. It says it's going to take roughly 45 seconds. We're going to come back to it because we're also going to look at something called Compound. And Compound says, okay, great that you can trade, but I think you might want to borrow coins. And loan coins out because if you start to, if those of you that have ambitions to work for a bank, 
a lot of their stuff they do is in debt, is loans, is is collateralizing debt. It's it's doing very cool things around that. And what compound what I can do is I can borrow or supply, loan out any asset. And the real reason why this is so important is the whole point of shorting. If those of you know what shorting is, shorting is betting something to go down. In shorting, you basically say this: I will buy, buy Brandon. I think Brandon Coin is going to go down, so I'll borrow some Brandon Coin off you. And I'll agree to pay it back, subject to a small bit of interest in two weeks. The moment I, I borrow it off him, I sell it for its current market price. In two weeks' time, Brandon Coin goes down to half of what it previously was. And I'm due to return this money to Brandon. So what I go to do is I go to the market, I buy it for the same amount that I borrowed off Brandon for half the price, and I give Brandon back his money. And what I've effectively done here is I sold it at this price <laughs> and after borrowing it, and I bought it back at this price. I mean, this all is a profit. That's what shorting effectively is which means you have to have borrowing markets if you're going to be able to short and bet something that goes down, which is a vital part of the financial ecosystem. For instance, I might want to borrow this token called DAI. We mentioned this earlier, a stable coin. I have to pay an interest rate. I might want to borrow 10 DAI, and it's going to say, okay, in fairness, I think, why have I got a borrowing limit? I think I might not have any collateral on that, that's why. Uh, but without going into this, because I don't want to pay gas fees, uh, I can uh, borrow or, and look at, by the way, look at the interest rates. I wanted to, if I were to lend out uh, the, one of the tokens I just sent to you, I can get a 7% interest rate. There's some reasons for this, <laughs> but uh, for argument's sake, uh, this is interesting. Uh, going back to the transaction we just did, it's complete, it cost me quite a lot of money, uh, but <coughs> I should now have some USDC sitting in my wallet. Let's see if the, yeah, there's my USDC. I've got less ETH and uh, the transaction just sits there. Uh, so all this is a very long way to say is you can start to do some really cool things really quickly. And now I want to finish with the problems, which you just saw. And um, the first transaction cost me £3.50, which is still quite a lot. The second transaction cost me 21 And that's because a lot of people are using Ethereum right now. Uh, and uh, <laughs> the problem with anyone using Ethereum is there's only uh, so much uh, computational power uh, and uh, <laughs> ability to actually verify stuff is happening. Uh, so the fees are actually ridiculous if you're trying to do anything like 20 quid, uh, which kind of renders it useless for day-to-day -day transactions, um, which also means we have gone on to the scalability point. Again, it's very volatile. You wouldn't use Ethereum to actually do anything. You'd only use it for these smart contract things. If I was going to give you money, if I was going to give you $1,000, I would do it in a stable coin that's fixed to the dollar. Uh, and the other thing is that the fact that I'm having to give this presentation to most of you uh, and you don't know how to kind of send money with crypto and do stuff like this, uh, means there is an adoption problem. You, you kind of, and the reason is actually things like MetaMask aren't the most simple. It's a different way of thinking about everything. Like this idea of I have to write down 24 words in case I lose access to this really long password um, is the different way to the thinking of a Facebook where you just make a password and hope it's not the same as everything else. Um, it's a much more secure way, uh, but fundamentally uh, it has to be more secure because you're dealing with large sums of money. And I want to end with a really, I did PPE. So here's the PPE bullshit point. Um, this is my, uh, this is, those of you who don't know, this is Tony Blair. Uh, and I want to talk about, you might be thinking, okay, Anthony, if blockchain is so cool, why have I not heard more about it, even though, even though it's so valuable? And the reason is, apart from in this bubble where I can do things like this and I can do really cool abstractions of it, in the real world, it's actually not used for anything because um, the whole point of blockchain is that you're effectively giving control of a monetary economic system to code. Um, which can seem like a really bad idea if the code is written badly. Um, and more importantly, um, there's a good reason for governments, quite rightly, uh, to want to keep control of the financial and monetary system uh, and why something like Bitcoin will not replace it. Um, but you could, for instance, use blockchain in the financial world um, to do trading. I've just shown you how you can exchange coins and borrow in short, like you could do that. Um, but if for those that you know the kind of markets, like the London Stock Exchange, where most of the trading in the UK happens, um, is a private business. <laughs> it's not a public good. It's a, like a private business that someone profits over. So to say that I'm actually going to put this onto this public kind of good thing, which is a blockchain that kind of runs on its own, its own, it doesn't really um, kind of profit. Uh, it kind of, yeah, it's a very different way of kind of building a system. Um, you'd have to kind of, yeah, cede control of running the exchange in the first place. So my specific point here is that with Tony Blair, Back into those of you kind of who did politics back in 1997, he initiated something called devolution, where he gave power uh, to Scotland, to Wales, uh, to Northern Ireland, uh, gave more power. And the reason he did this was not for, to enhance democracy, was not to make things fairer and more kind of 
kind of uh, uh, kind of democratic. He did this because actually Labour were, were suffering these areas and to set up these kind of new governments in these areas would actually give Labour more of a stronghold here uh, and allow them to be at least part of the governing parties. Um, what actually ended up happening was in Wales, this is the case, but in Scotland, um, this, uh, th this, uh, uh, um, uh, Brandon, it says you're asking for control of my screen. <laughs> I don't think that's the case. Um, what is actually the case is that, um, well, I've just given my control of my screen to someone, which sounds like a really bad idea. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Um, Have we lost Anthony again? I think we have. Um, yeah, it looks like we have. Okay. Cool. At the moment, uh, just for everyone's information, so I am sending money. Well, ETH um, to some addresses in the chat um, and it will be on its way to you shortly. In fact, actually the, the block time's pretty quick. The confirmation time's pretty quick. So uh, can you, Brandon, can you let me show my screen? Yeah, yeah, that's been done. Anyway, I'm gonna finish my point. Uh, do you wanna let me show my screen? Yeah, have you got control? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so anyway, just to finish the points, uh, there's a good reason why you might not uh, want to. Uh, there's a good reason why people might not always want to concede control of the way a system works, because there are unintended consequences, even if the uh, the first move is actually to benefit uh, the person who uh, uh, who cedes control. And I think in blockchain, the reason that I think it looks like a lot like blockchain is I can 100% imagine a world where the London Stock Exchange runs on a blockchain system. And this will, in the short term, probably be to the benefit of people who kind of run the London Stock Exchange or kind of run the financial system. But we actually don't know, once you kind of do something fundamentally, seeds control away from the central, central party that kind of makes code law, uh, you don't know what's going to happen. So this is why I think actually blockchain adoption will always be a little bit slow because it's kind of a powerful thing. Like, uh, you, and you really don't want the main currency to be a digital currency because then you've got people, the, people can move money without being checked and do criminal things with them. And that would be a, a bad thing. Um, just to finish off, uh, for any of you that want to kind of get involved, uh, learn more about blockchain, Encode runs a lot of events, all good. Anyway, guys, uh, any uh, if there's any questions, uh, now is the time. Uh, I will pay some links. If you want to learn more about blockchain, get involved with Encode, uh, you can uh, kind of uh, kind of drop me a line. Uh, I'll paste my email into, into chat as well. Uh, but any questions, I'd be more than happy uh, to kind of answer them. Yes. Uh, where, should, where are we looking? So there are a lot of questions in the chat. Okay, let's, let's um, get some So uh, let's... Um, yeah, before I forget, like, once again, apologies, everyone. It's not what you want on a uh, Tuesday evening, GMT. So some of the questions include, here's one. Um, okay. Sorry, because some of them you've, uh, you've already answered. Um, should we do, the, have you done the one about quantum computing? <laughs> no, I haven't. I'll yet. say for crypto keys of quantum computing. That's your answer is there are quantum safe ways of doing this. Brandon, given you study quantum, do you want to give the, the uh, complicated uh, uh, answer? Yeah, so, um not r really you don't need to worry too much okay um essentially because quantum computing has a long way to go before it can break um encryption on crypto furthermore due to the errors with quantum computing and us not being able to solve them let alone build a quantum computer even if we had a, a good one you'd need a lot of computational power to break standard RSA or standard uh, encryption, other encryption protocols. So there's still quite a long way um, for that to happen. But it is on, it is on the horizon. Like it's definitely, people are thinking about it, but you don't need to worry about it for now. 
Okay. Uh, is there any AI-based trading platforms or softwares for blockchain? Well, I guess there's two ways to answer this. Um, I don't think AI is probably not the way to think about it, but you can definitely start kind of trading. Given this, like, this is lines of code. You, you kind of saw what I just did. Like, I, I sent something to, effectively, I sent this thing that we call money, like, that is Ethereum or USDC or whatever it is, to this address, which is also represented effectively by a line of code. Um, uh, and we just happen to call this uh, the it's money for various reasons. Um, so you can you can program that. You can say if uh, if x and y event happens buy this coin if or you, very simply you could say the price goes to this point buy it the price goes to this point sell it and if you mean like oh i want to benefit from crypto and are there any kind of ai kind of algorithmic trading platforms there are lots of them but if you want to be exposed to crypto i would just buy some ethereum that's like the the very kind of simplest way to do that that's just the way to kind of get exposure I uh, hope that answers uh, your question, Ali. Uh, how is the currency secured? Where does its value come from? So if something like Bitcoin, um, there's actually, your, your guess is as good as mine uh, in, in many respects because um, Bitcoin is used is what it's used for. It was the original currency for just sending something that looks like money, but net don't necessarily, <laughs> doesn't necessarily have the value of money to another person. People then gave it money because they thought, okay, well, given I can do this and no one can stop me doing this, like, this sounds like a cool thing that I could use as a currency. And then people realized it was too volatile. So they didn't use it as currency. They used it as kind of like a store of wealth that no government could touch. And now, quite frankly, the reason it's valuable is just like as a figurehead for crypto. Bitcoin is a terrible thing to use as a currency because it's so volatile. And like nothing actually give its value, gives it value because it's not underpinned by anything. But for most other currencies, I can create a use case. So Ethereum, you have to pay an Ether to you to build smart contracts. So effectively, like, imagine like paying Apple every time you built an app. That's kind of what's happening here. And so you, you can understand why there would then be an economy for Ether. And um, for a stable coin, like I showed before, that are kind of worth a, like a dollar, uh, I, I, what I would do in these cases is I would uh, kind of, uh, I would effectively lock up one dollar's worth of something else and mint a dollar. Uh, so like somewhere there'd be a, a kind of vault that said, okay, here's one dollar's worth of stuff. And now I'd get a token that represents this one dollar worth of stuff. And I could be pretty confident uh, is worth a dollar. And various other complicated algorithmic ways of doing the same effective calculation of saying, I will trade one dollar's worth of stuff to this one dollar's worth of stuff. I need some system to make sure I'm always kind of this collateral is worth a dollar and this token is worth a dollar. Uh, so that's kind of a brief thing. And this, again, you can have various different tokens. You can have a token that represents something in the real world. We call this a security token. It can represent a house. And again, therefore it would have its share of the value of that house. Or you can have things that have utility that you can actually use them for something. And that's where their value comes from. Not all of them are there for to be like speculative assets. They're actually there to do something most importantly. Um, what if something goes wrong? Can I go to court? It depends what you do with it. I mean, nothing in and of itself with the technology is, is fundamentally flawed. Pay your taxes. Um, yeah, <laughs> pay your taxes. Uh, don't do anything wrong. Don't do anything illegal with crypto. Uh, you'll be absolutely fine. There's nothing. Uh, the technology itself is is completely normal, completely nice. It's not normal, completely fine. Uh, and actually, the biggest place where you can buy crypto, which is called Coinbase, is doing an IPO in two months. So that kind of adds a little bit more legitimacy, I hope. Uh, without getting into details, how do you explain those high lending rates when it comes to crypto? Um, so it kind of is a product of why are lending rates so high? Um, so it's a product of volatility, more kind of like if I lend you a coin, um, <laughs> so, okay, that's the person needs to mute themselves. Um, if I, uh, uh, lend you a coin at such and such value, because I, the value just in crypto is so volatile, and it could change so much. I need an interest rate to kind of ensure that I'm getting like I'm not losing out so that my collateral is worth a lot less for the next day. If I give you 10 pounds worth of something today and it's actually worth five pounds tomorrow, I'm gonna to want an interest rate to compensate me, not just for the um, the kind of inconvenience of not having that $10 for this day period, but also to cover the risk of it going down. So it's a product of kind of volatility. Um, there are ways to hedge that, of course, there are many ways to hedge that, uh, but that's kind of the main reason. And also kind of gas fees as well. It's kind of a nice way of thinking of it. Um, is Ethereum compatible with dark net markets? No, like not like it's in fact, actually it's, you kind of to know, like you could use a crypto, there are private cryptocurrencies. I'd be lying if I said there wasn't. Um, you just saw that, like, you know my address is now. So if you know my address and you know it's linked to me, like if I'm doing something illegal, you see some money moving weirdly, you can say, ah, and people actually do this as a, as a, like a, 
as a career, they kind of track cryptocurrency movements for, to make sure that people aren't, uh, to, to see if there's any abnormal movements in money. Because again, I can, I can not only just show you that money's moved from A to B, I can show you where that money's been throughout history, um, of the history of crypto. Um, there are private coins, which I guess you could do this, but to be honest, there is a private way to do stuff in the real world as well. It's called cash. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, but I'm actually not very familiar with <laughs> the intricacies of the dark net anyway. So maybe maybe it's used a lot and I, and I don't know. Uh, how safe is it to share a public address and link to yourself? Uh, probably wasn't the best idea, uh, but I use this as like a public wallet I just use. Uh, and I think for most of you as well, you now, for those of you that got 10, dollars worth of Ethereum today, um, maybe set up a new wallet. You can set up like a million uh, and use that if you are considering holding a lot of crypto, hold a different one because yeah, maybe in, in some cases, I could, so here's the case where you can get screwed over. If you can see that this wallet, let's say the wallet I showed you is mine and you know it's mine and you know that it has a billion kind of dollars on it. And then I, uh, and then you could technically hold a gun to my head and go, give me your private keys. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I would have to give them to you and like nothing would be able to stop that. There, I mean, there are, there are potential safeguards, but in general, nothing could stop that. So that is a good reason why you wouldn't want to associate your kind of prior, your address with a person. But this was just an address I use for like demonstration purposes. And, like you can, I don't care if I lose access to that address. It's got a couple hundred quid on it. Um, who is yeah? Uh, the, what is the use of these decentralized currencies when adoption is low and crypto is arguably very nice? Um, so, uh, in general, so they have their own uses. So, like the one I showed you, um, uh, like Compound, like has a token, and it need, the reason why it has a token is is to control governments governance of that platform. So you could have one that uh, yeah, a token would be like if, if depending on how much of the token I hold is how many votes I get for changes in the way the rules work. Um, they actually within crypto, the adoption is quite high. Like everyone uses Ethereum, everything's built on Ethereum. Uh, like uh, people like use it to, to trade money, to like send money to each other, to like do trades, to do fundraising. Um, and yeah, if I'm building a new platform, that's like a trading platform, a lending platform, it will have its own token that maybe you pay the fees in and that's used to kind of um, reward loyalty, do governance. There's many kind of use cases. Um, so um, yeah, there's, many things and it's good. best to think of them as that you've got security tokens that represent something in the real world or represent equity that look like a stock and a share and utility tokens that do something on a platform a little bit like how um if only if you've had a playstation like playstation network kind of points uh kind of, or current or you play fifa uh fifa tokens or any kind of token you have within the game it's virtually like that what do you use those for you use it to kind of buy stuff on that platform you use it to maybe vote you use it to kind of um yeah, uh, interact with the platform. It, it's kind of like that as the way to think of it. Um, someone is changing their name and messaging. Okay, that's, that's... Yeah, I've taken care of that now as well. Okay, how can blockchain help smallholder, smallholder farmers in the developing world get a fair share of global prices for their produce? Um, in the general terms, like, it's not as simple, it's not very simple. I don't think it necessarily could help them like right now um but uh for there are there is one suggestion you could use it for supply chains so supply chains what you actually want is perfect information and everyone to have this kind of information so for instance if i've got if i'm producing I don't know, cocoa beans i will know that these cocoa beans came from this place they actually came from this place it's stored on one kind of database that no one can kind of tamper with that it's moved from x producer to kind of y distributor and the Y distributor has transported it to X, uh, Z uh, distributor. So you can understand why you'd want this information to kind of be on, on, uh, on a database that doesn't get tampered with that everyone kind of access to, which is basically a blockchain. Um, but there are, you can kind of find a hole in this immediately, which is like, well, how do I know the information going onto the blockchain is kind of right in the first place? And then you get into really complicated practical questions. And that's the reason why uh, you don't use it. Uh, so technically you could do something like that, but I don't think blockchain could actually realistically help small, small holder farmers today. Um, cool. I think that's all the questions on mine. Have you got any other questions that you've seen, Brandon? I think it's no, kind of left. That, that, I think that's everything. I think one thing to touch on is you actually did like, cause you do crypto transactions so frequently. You, there's some things that you just did without thinking that I think it's quite important for people to know, which is before you send the transaction, you briefly 
well, you check the address. Um, and obviously it's quite a long string of characters, but it's good to always double check because as we can see, not everything's secure, even Zoom or your own clipboard. So before you send any cash anywhere, please. Yeah, uh, yes, please, please, please do. <laughs> uh, do not be reckless. I just want to take these questions. Um, so out of the use cases you come across, how many are really qualifying for a blockchain solution? It's a great question. Not many. <laughs> Basically, if it involves something physical in the real world, you have to think, how do I get this information onto a spreadsheet? Like, it's not going to happen. Like, it's very difficult to do. So you need to think of digital use cases, like interacting with Facebook, like inter buying and selling, sending money is like a purely digital transaction these days. Uh, sending my data, purely digital transaction. This is where blockchain really works because I don't have these problems of how do I get stuff that's physical in the real world onto a blockchain? Because that sounds hard. Um, could someone switch out a product still the ID? Yeah, this is basically the same problem. Um, in general, like just to talk about blockchain IDs, if you're I, if you mean ID is a private key, like this password I have, this very long password. Um, again, unless someone steals it from me, um, like and takes my identity in that that way, shape, or form, uh, I, uh, I I I mean I should be okay. Uh, but yeah, there there are many many ways people can kind of hoax you. Uh, but in general, if you have your keys, you'll be all right. Um, do local uh, legislations predominate over what you can do with blockchain? I'm asking risking regarding the risk of it being a loophole for activities such as tax fraud. So in the UK, taxes are really simple. Uh, so you you basically pay technically pay tax on every transaction you do. So if I sell a thing, that transaction I did was a taxable event effectively because I effectively sold a thing like a stock. Um, in reality, for a tiny transaction, no one cares. Um, but for if I was selling a lot of Ethereum, it would be a taxable event. And I was if I wasn't paying tax, it would be fraud. You're right to suggest, how do you know that this, this, this Ethereum is mine? Um, in reality, so for, for you and me, this is very simple. Eventually money, you would have had to get that Ethereum um, and that Ethereum must have, would have come from somewhere, which means you would have bought it with cash and dollars or cash and dollars, which are called fiat. Um, so there's a trace and I can, I can like trace this <laughs> on a blockchain like really, really simply, like seeing the money move. Uh, so like, again, you can do this. Obviously, if um, you did something illegal and you received crypto for it and you never sold it to be at, yes, it would be very hard to track, track people. This is the exact same with cash. So this is not a problem that is crypto is necessarily uh, uh, exacerbating. It's not necessarily exacerbating. I, and I think actually in the most part, um, I, I read an article recently that criminal activities are still done in cash because again, I have to crypto, like mo you can't pay for things in Bitcoin or Ethereum. So I have to move it into normal pounds of dollars sometime. Uh, so in that case, uh, <laughs> it's better just to have cash, I've kind of been told, or at least this article kind of, kind of said. Um, what else? Uh, what, uh, I also think is, what I also think is a challenge is that even for a good use case, you still need to decide what data to go on the ledger and what stay off the ledger. Yeah, in general, um, I guess. Uh, but uh, if, you've got a, if you've got a system where to interact with it, you own, can only use a ledger. Like, for instance, take again, take something like Facebook, like think of it from a two from completely different point of view. There's nothing that you do on Facebook that isn't <laughs> linked to your Facebook account. Like that, that you have to have an account to interact with it. And this is a nice way to think about crypto. You have to have a ledger <laughs> in order to, uh, or a ledger literally means this device as well. But you literally have to kind of interact with the system to do anything. So the kind of the the, the question is kind of answered fairly simply. Uh, in that respect, uh, that yeah, it, you can't really decide what goes on or not because literally to interact with the system, you have to use it. Um, apart from Bitcoin Ethereum, what are some of the other cryptocurrencies to watch out for? I don't know. Uh, that's a, that's an investment question. I would never give investment advice. Uh, go. There's a website called CoinGecko. It has all of the coins. You can have a look at some interesting ones, uh, and you can check and, and please read about them. Uh, but in general, different types. You've got stable coins that link to a dollar. You've got uh, uh, and do you can do some really cool things around that. You've got lending products you can build complex financial products you can you can have competitors to ethereum competitors to bitcoin everything in between to be honest for buying a very nicely with bitcoin does the tax man know uh well good luck so if you had a friend in italy who's happy to receive bitcoin and technically yeah i guess you could but then there, you, when you bought the house you on the deed or the you have to register it with someone and you'd have to say source of payment so you'd have to kind of lie uh, so uh, like you can always lie to the tax man <laughs> it's just eventually you might get found out if massive amounts of money are going in and out of your bank account uh, so yeah, you can do you can lie uh, uh yeah you, you can lie about anything but i think in general with crypto my the thing that the conclusion i've come to recently is 
Uh, if you want to interact with the real world, you're going to have to go into fiat. Sometimes the moment you go into fiat with crypto, it, there's a, basically a log of everything. So uh, there's no point kind of, you can't really evade tax. Um, what does this mean, digital material you buy? What does this mean, digital material you buy can have a smart contract, which makes it actually yours. So if you lose account, you bought it with, you still own it through your address. Yeah. And also the, technically the address owns it and you own the address um, is a good way of thinking about it. Um, but, and you can either kind of, there are, uh, for those of you sort of MetaMask right now, it would have asked you for 24 words. And these 24 words are kind of like a backup password. So you normally write them down on a piece of paper. And if you ever lose access, you could still get access to this address. The address is like an account by just putting this backup password in. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, but uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, is there any place you can view the public ledger? Yeah, so uh, different blockchains have different ones. Uh, so Ethereum is a blockchain. Uh, so. Uh, I would, this one is called Etherscan and you can see all the Ethereum transactions. So again, unless you know what you're looking for, it's kind of hard to kind of, um, it's kind of hard to, to know, but I've, for instance, before I've always, I like you, you can start doing some, if you know what, who, if you know that what, what someone's wallet address is and they're like the particular invention individual, you can start doing some cool things about like what they did, what they trade. Uh, but this is a bit niche. Um, or would it be great if you could send us a follow-up email do you just how to follow you yeah uh so we'll uh brandon will send a follow-up email with some stuff about uh in code uh cool where to follow newsletter uh so in general uh, you can sign up on encode.club uh, or join our discord which is a kind of private community uh or where you can yeah kind of uh, find out more uh cool any other questions anyone uh, i'm kind of happy to to stick around um uh yeah uh, cool. Well, look, uh, guys, please, uh, you know, I hope you know a little bit more about crypto. If you have any questions, I will repaste in my email. Feel free to drop me an email with any information, with any question you have. I'll be more than happy to answer it. And if you do, if you're a developer, you want to get more involved with what we do at Encode, or actually in general, we do events for everyone uh, with kind of the leading speed, kind of figures in the space. Uh, please kind of follow what we do in Encode, sign up for the newsletter, uh, go to Discord, or we'll follow the great events that Oxford Blockchain do. And Brandon is, is going to lead. Yeah, thanks again, Anthony. Um, those who posted addresses in the chat, I've uh, selected a few of them and sent you some ETH. And I see a few of you have posted that you've received it. Um, yeah, I, I think as Anthony says, I, I'd definitely be doing you guys a disservice if I didn't plug Encode Club because they have an amazing developer community, access to like the biggest names in the space, Binance, Avalanche, um, it wasn't just a few months ago where we had an AMA with uh, CZ, the CEO of Binance, the largest crypto currency exchange in the world at the moment. So definitely stay involved uh, with Oxford Blockchain and Encode Club. And um, there's more there's more in its way. I think next week we're going to be going into detail more about decentralized finance and talking to someone, uh, Michael, Michael Bentley, who has just about, well, yeah, they're working on a project called Euler, which is a DeFi uh, permissionless lending platform. Um, so, and he's gonna give an introduction to the decentralized space. And I'm sure he'll talk about his, uh, his current project that he's working on. Uh, other than that, yeah, I think that's everything covered. Uh, anything coming up about quantum computing? No, nah, it's a slow space. Uh, I think blockchain is much more rapid, so don't you worry. But um, yeah, all the best and uh, take care. Link for the next talk is on our website, um, oxfordblockchain.co.uk. And you can view our events and our posts all there. Okay, but thank you all and farewell. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Good to meet you all.